Good morning and uh, welcome to this uh, seminar series on future leaders in mechanobiology. My pleasure, I'm Daniel Cosgrove. I'm at Penn State University, relatively new to uh, CEMB. And uh, it's my job to, to uh, introduce this, the speaker and, uh, to, and to help uh, with the questions uh, afterwards. And so today's speaker is, is Evan Rodden and he's uh, a little bit of a, a bit of his background. So he got his uh, master's degree, his diploma in the University of Belgrade. And uh, then he got a, a doctorate in uh, the Technical University in Dresden. That was in 2015. And tw since 2016, he has been working as a postdoc at uh, uh, Liz Haswell's lab in University, uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, his topic for today is, is uh, vacuoles and the piezo channel, so mechanosensitive channel. And with that, I will uh, uh, welcome you to the seminar series and uh, please you can share your screen and get started. Oh, but before you do, I have a couple, couple of announcements, sorry. No uh, first of all, for the audience, if you have questions, I encourage you to put the questions in the chat box and at the, at the end of his uh, 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 presentation, uh, he or I will go through through some of those and 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 pick the ones that sound more most interesting or maybe we'll go through them all. It'll depend on how many there are. If there's too many, we'll kind of arbitrarily pick some things. If you don't put things on chat box, uh, though, hopefully there will be an opportunity for you to just to voice your questions as we go along, and we can have a, a freewheeling discussion as uh, as it goes along. Uh, secondly, there's. Uh, uh, we request, I've been asked to announce that we're requesting you to nominate speakers for, for next, uh, ser next uh, year in this seminar series. And there's going to be a form that will be put, the link for it will be put in the chat box. So look for it. It was just put there now. So you can, you can fill out that form, download it. Um, and uh, yes, and this seminar series is being recorded. So I think I got all my announcements right. So uh, please, you can start even. Sure. Okay, you should see now my main presentation, correct? <laughs> That's correct. Okay, great. Okay, so well, thank you for that ni last, nice introduction. And I would like to start by thanking the organizers for allowing me to, or inviting me to present at this amazing seminar series and for uh, to kind of present the project I've been working on in the Haswell lab over the last few years here at the Washington University. So here I'm primarily focusing on the mechano cellular mechanical sensing. And as probably most people at this center is familiar, uh, okay. Okay, here. As most uh, people are familiar, so this ability to sense and respond to mechanical forces is a fundamental property of most, if not all, ancient things, and it's actually very ancient. I'm just going to highlight with a few examples. So we see that in bacteria, they have to perceive different forces like shear, shear stress associated with fluid uh, flow or adhesion forces or different subject topology. I don't have to explain how animals perceive mechanical forces. I think we are all personally familiar with that, but this is also present for example in plants. And here I give an example from one of my old experiments where Herbidopsis root is able to perceive and find and navigate its way around the barrier. In this, in this case, is a cover slip I put in front of it. And of course, uh, mechanical sensing doesn't operate only on the whole organism level, actually it operates on several different scales. So as I show here in different organ, organ, of whole organisms, but also individual organs. An example, for example, is the compression sensed by the joints in different animals. Individual cells, both in cellular and multicellular organisms can perceive forces. And something I'm particularly interested in is actually by the organelles themselves. So they also have the ability to perceive mechanical forces. And you might be wondering, like, why would organelles need to do that? So, but you have to remember that actually they operate in a very crowded cell. And so they often experience mechanical forces through collision or being pushed against each other. And here I'm kind of showing an example from an animal, like there's a flat growing animal culture cells, but you can see the ER microtubule being pushed into the mitochondrial and directly forcing an exiting force on it. 
And also organelles can be exposed to forces from such a skeleton being pushed or pulled or stretched both the skeleton as well as interaction with other organelles. So this is something I'm particularly interested in. And in general, in the Haswell lab, in the most broadest sense, we are particularly interested in specifically plant mechanical sensation, which we can kind of classify or divide in two kind of categories. is ability to respond and perceive force both external and internal mechanical cues. And a classical example of external cue would be the perception of touch. And here I'm going to show you an example of how plants actually perceive touch. In this case, it's a video from one of my side projects where um, a sanju, so this is carnivorous sanju plants, which is expressing the solid calcium biosensor, is a response to touch. And here, if I touch the bottom leaf at the bottom, you can see there is a very rapid and fast spreading calcium wave to the whole plant, which within about 30 seconds informs the whole plant there has been something happened to one of the leaves. However, this also holds true for the internal cues. For example, here as example, I'm showing you moss cells, which are now again expresses a solid calcium sensor. And now these cells are actually swelling in response to the hypersmotic downshock. So that now they went from high osmolarity to low, forcing water to enter the cell and they expand. As you can actually see, this again causes a increased calcium and also a wave of calcium spreading down the filament, again, informing the whole plant. And in this case, one thing to kind of notice, but the, the internal organelles are particularly involved in this process. As you can see, the vacuole, which was a black space here, expands, when, dramatically expands in response to mechanical force. But it directly responds to the water entry and also participates in this response. And another very important thing to note in both these cases is actually that mechanical perception is often linked to ion signaling. And in particular, in both these cases, the calcium signaling is a big marker of mechanical transduction. And one of the main mechanisms and one of the main reasons why this is the case is because most organisms, one of the main mechanisms most organisms use to perceive mechanical forces is through the actions of mechanosensitive ion channels, which uh, uh, are able to convert mechanical forces, mechanical signals like membrane tensions into an electro electrochemical, uh, electrochemical signal of ion flow. So ion channels are present in almost all living systems, and they're present in both in plasma membrane and intercellular membranes, while the ones on plasma membrane tend to more sense external cues versus the intercellular membrane ones tend to more be involved in perception of internal cues. And they're able to reopen in response to the membrane ten direct membrane tension or the membrane deformation, then I'll allow ions to flow down the electrochemical gradient. Now, depending how is this perceived will depend dramatically on what cells we're talking about, what membrane and what channel type. So this can either be in, uh, direct signaling, for example, calcium flow, which activates signaling, but this can also lead to membrane depolarization or direct osmoregulation, or even in some cases, there are non-ionic signals associated with the channels. And so far, there are several families of channels, uh, ion channels that have been identified. And uh, they are present in all living organisms. And, but here I'm highlighting the one of the best studied ones in bacterial, plant, and animal lineages. All these families independently evolved, and they're actually very diverse, both in the way they're structured as well as the mechanisms of actions. And they have a very varying number of homologs. Some of them have only one homolog per family, while others can be as high as 20. Uh, for many years, the kind of the main focus of the Haswell lab here was the miscast or MSL family, which is uh, shared by both bacteria and plants, and in plants descends from bacterial ancestors. However, when I joined the lab, I started a brand new line of research focusing on the piezo family, which is a eukaryotic specific family, and which beforehand hasn't been studied in plants. And just gonna give you a quick introduction of what piezos actually do. So they were discovered a little over 10 years ago in animals, specifically in mouse, and our collaborator, Arden Papaputian, won a Nobel Prize for the discovery back in the fall. And these channels localize to the plasma membrane, primarily into plasma membrane in animals, and there they function as mechanically activated calcium cation channels. And here I'm kind of showing like a classical experiment kind of demonstrating that uh, uh, channel, like mechanical channel activity. So when we actually attach an electrode to the cell, allowing us to measure the ion flow across the membrane, uh, across the membrane and then we directly poke a cell with a probe, we can see that in response to that poke, so that mechanical force, the channels activate and release ions, uh, uh, allow the flow of ions across the membrane. And what you can see is that with increased intensity of the poke, more and more ions flow. 
And one, you can also see a very characteristic uh, of piezo channels is they actually open very rapidly in response to the membrane, membrane uh, of response to force, but they also close very rapidly, even though the force still might be present. So they go into inactivation mode, which is somewhat a characteristic, characteristic of this family. In animals, uh, which so the mammals have two piezo homologs, both are essential for life. So the loss is uh, loss leads to embryo mortality. However, there's also several disease causing mutations which have been associated with these channels. And in animals, they're involved in numerous functions, but just going to highlight a few. They're involved in perception of light charge, shear stress, compressive forces, and many others. And so far, these channels have been mostly studied in animals. However, they're actually quite widespread among eukaryotes. And to kind of demonstrate this, here is a, a relatively comprehensive phylogenetic tree of piezo families that are generated, where you actually see uh, homo the homologs from many different eukaryotic lineages. I'm not going to go into too much details in the, of this tree. I'm happy to discuss later on if people are interested. But to kind of just give a few highlights, so they do appear to descend from a single ancestor. And then that ancestor, the ancestral gene underwent a numerous independent duplications and deletions in different lineages. So for example, modern day, uh, both animals and plants have anywhere between one and three homologs, depending which particular species we, we look through, we look at. So vertebrates usually have either two or three, but plants have a huge variations of the numbers. And also what was interesting for me that actually they appear to be lost in fungi, which is like another classical model system we tend to study, but the piezos appear to be lost in that lineage. My main interest was actually, and what has kind of started working on this project, was in two homologs from this moss Fiscometrium patens, which actually sit right here on my phylogenetic tree. And you can actually see that these two genes are a product of duplication, sometimes in the ancestry of mosses roughly and sometimes between 320 and 490 million years ago. And you might be wondering like why I'm interested in mosses of all species. Like they're cute, but like they're not that important. However, there actually are several good reasons. Some of them are very practical reasons because they're amazing model system for research. And here I highlight some of them. So this species formerly called Fiscometrella, two years ago they changed the name to Fiscometrium patens. It has a haplogenetics as a very simple to cultivate and grows really, really, grows really fast. It has an extremely efficient homolo homologous recombination. Its, its efficiency is the same or higher than E. coli or yeast, which allows a really efficient and really fast genome editing. It has fully sequenced genome, a very simple body plan, uh, which allows for very easy imaging, so, which is sometimes challenging with more complex, organi more complex organisms. And for example, the juvenile tissue, which is drawn here, is only comprised of two cell types, both which are characterized by this tip, by this tip growth, which is a very specialized tip, which is present in many different species, where only the tip of the cell grows, so the material is deposited at the tip of the cell, which kind of expands, and the rest of the cell is more stationary behind. And he, this is an example of colonial cells. Another example in animals, for example, are axons grow for the, uh, through these mechanisms. And here is a, uh, sorry, here is a video kind of demonstrating how this looks like. And you can see this is colonial cells. They grow, uh, grow exploring new areas, and then they split at some point. They just form a new cell wall, uh, completing the division. And this particular cell type is called colonial cell. This is a main cell, which I mean, mostly focus in the rest of the, my, talk, my talk and mostly refer to them as a tip growing cell. And their main job in the most plant is to actually expand the colony, kind of explore the new areas, and they grow very fast away from the main plant and can explore the new areas. So the main, but actually the main reason why we were actually interested in mosses is because it's their phylogenetic position, because I'm very interested in the evolution of the process of uh, me mechanization. So not only what piezos do in plants, but also how that process evolved. So mosses are actually representative of the bryophyte lineage, which are here in this kind of cartoon we made. They sit here, and as you can see, they're actually a sister group to all other land plants, which are called vascular plants. So these two groups, actually, so the bryophyte and the vascular plants split about half a billion years ago, right around the time when actually and, uh, plants conquered land. So if you actually compare, if you study both bryophytes and the vascular plants, for example, the flowering plants, we can then kind of compare and study and, uh, and determine which trait appeared prior or around the time where plants conquered land, which was a pivotal moment in Earth history and kind of really changed the flow of the evolution and the way that life works nowadays. So this is kind of why I want to be particularly interested in this model species. 
And then actually started looking into, into piezo homologs. The big, obviously, the first question is we already have well funded animal counterparts. How similar are these plant homologs to their animal counterparts, both on the sequence level as well as the structural conservation? Before I show you how similar they are, I'm just going to give you a quick introduction how they actually look like in animals. And here is a cryo EM structure of mouse piezo 2. And so just I showed, so the mouse has two homologs and a mouse has two homologs, but they're actually not. They're independent duplications. The naming is just a little bit confusing. <laughs> but so this is a mouse, the cow EM structure of the mouse piezo 2, and you can see it has a very characteristic pro propeller like shape. And mouse piezo 1 is a very similar in structures, and people who are interested here some references how they, they can see how that looks like. So they are here color coded. They actually, the, these complexes are formed for a former homotraumatic complex. They're exceptionally large in size, usually around one megadalton or bigger, because each subunit is exceptionally large. And the subunits are merged in their uh, C termini. They kind of form the central pore domain. And then they have this kind of expanding uh, pro blade like uh, domains extending from the main pore. As you can see here, forming this propeller. And also, when you look on the side, these actually are bent and able, actually able to bend the membrane, uh, bend the membrane, forming like a divot inside of the membrane. A little trivia, which is kind of my favorite information, these proteins are record holders. They are the largest known proteins with the largest known number of transformer domains. So each subunit has 38 transformer domains, 114 for the whole complex, so they're really anchored to the membrane. And these domains are actually organized into two main modules, like a smaller core module, which has two domains, so the two transmit domains, the outer helix and inner helix, which actually is a pore lining. So this is right where the ions flow. And on top of that, they have a cap domain, which sits on top of that central domain, and as well as C terminal domain, which is at the bottom of the protein. So this is that sent, the pore domain is what actually they meet in the middle. And then from there, it expands the mechanical transduction module, which forms this piezo repeats which actually form these kind of arms. And this is probably the part which actually is able to sense the changes in the mechanics, the mechanical forces within the membranes. So now when we actually have a little kind of familiarity how these look like, we can see how similar they are to plants. So surprisingly, actually, there is a very low primary sequence conservation between animal and plants. So this is a little bit higher within the very in the, the pore, the module. So the inner helix, the C-terminal, there's a little bit higher conservation, but generally it's a very low conservation on the primary sequence. So it was a really big question whether actually what is the, uh, their uh, structure conservation? Do they actually able to form similar structures? And to try to answer this, we turn to the now new, uh, new, newly developed tools of actually predictive softwares, which can actually predict uh, tertiary structures of the proteins. And we did both FIRE2 model, model, predicted model, as well as I'm not showing here of the, the alpha fold model. And you actually kind of see here, this is the, the model of MOS piezo 2, but actually MOS 1 or piezo 1 looks very similar. They actually, despite low cons sequence conservation, they actually are able to predicted to form a very similar structure. So we have the pore module with the inner helix, outer helix, as well as a cap domain sitting on top of it, and a C terminal domain sitting below it, as well as main transmitter domains forming this characteristic blade shape, kind of like bending away from the main, from the main channel. And just, just going to highlight how similar they are. Here is actually a, where I uh, superimpose the model of MOS piezo 2 onto the cryo here in gray, onto the cryo EM structure of the mouse piezo 2, uh, which are here shown as a trimer. And then in different color, the monomers are in different color of blue. And you can actually see they actually have a really good overlap with a couple of regions where I have it with the arrowhead, where they actually. Uh, uh, where they kind of uh, disagree in the, in the line. So this actually kind of told us like, okay, this interesting, this does suggest that the piezos, plant piezos are likely, able, are possibly able to form the similar structures as animals and possibly functioning again as a channels, similar as what we see in plants, uh, in animals. So, and then as we are classical genetics, uh, genetics and we, we did a classical experiments of knock, to, uh, knock out the protein to, and to see what actually functions we actually play in plant cells. And we use CRISPR to generate both single and double piezo mutants. And with single mutants, we actually didn't see any significant growth alteration, which was already a significant departure from animals. Whereas I said, the loss of either is embryo lethal. In plants, they actually you know, function fine. How, with, uh, with the double mutants, we did see some growth defects. They were mild, but there were some defects. So this is specifically focusing on these cell. So this is a juvenile tissue. 
And these cells, as I said before, they grow by the tip and they kind of expand the main plant. So they grow away from the main plant relatively quickly, kind of finding the new territories. And in the wild type, you can see these filaments uh, here. This their cell wall is stained with uh, their cell wall is stained, and this is what you see in cyan. You can see that they they relatively straight filaments growing away from the main plant. And uh, however, in the double mutant, they actually still exist and grow, but they are slightly smaller or shorter, and they actually don't expand as far away from the main plant, and they tend to be kind of more curved. And we actually quantified, and yes, indeed, they do grow slightly slower, so the tip expansion is slightly slower, and the cells, these cells in double mutants are indeed, are indeed uh, slightly shorter, however, the thickness is maintained, and the whole filaments are slightly, uh, slightly uh, more curved. This was interesting, and we do, we do have phenotype. However, generally growth, growth defects are not the most exciting phenotype because many gene alterations cause growth defects. So we kind of wanted to kind of dive in more specifically. And we generally focus from in the, more, the rest of the talk, I will specifically focus on this cell type where we saw this initial phenotype. The first thing we really wanted to see is it actually the, uh, the, local, the subcellular localization of these proteins in plants, fully expecting them to be localized to the, vacuum, the plasma membrane as they are in animals. However, as it was a big surprise to us when we actually overexpressed either MOS PSO1 or PSO2 tagged with monomeric GFP, we actually saw that they exclusively target to the, to the vacuolar membrane, which is a large central organelle inside of the cell, as you can kind of see here, decorated in green. It's actually able to push uh, chloroplasts and other organelles like nucleus and chloroplasts, which are here in magenta. This was a big surprise, but sometimes overexpression can cause different artifacts. So we also did utilize the power of MOS genetics and actually integrated monomeric GFP directly into the native loci. We knocked in GFP into the native loci of both PSO1 and PSO2. And, but again, we saw the same phenotype, not, not phenotype, we saw the same pattern where PSO is localized now with much lower expression levels with the, again, localized to the vacuolar membrane, as you can kind of see here, these large organelles pushing all other organelles to the edge. And here again, chloroplasts, these green blobs is actually chloroplast autofluorescence. It's not an actual signal, green signal. The dotted line is green signal. This was very exciting for us. And before I move on, it's just kind of quick introduction for people who are less familiar is what plant vacuoles are. So these are very large active organelles, which actually perform numerous functions. They're involved in metabolite and ion storage. They perform osmotic potential maintenance. They're involved in osmotic potential maintenance, as well as pH maintenance, and they participate in cellular degradation and detoxification. In a classical in most of the classical cell biology books, they're drawn as this kind of like a balloons kind of relatively inert balloon sitting inside of the cell, occupying part of the cell volume and tend often be ignored. However, they actually don't look like that in nature usually. This is, as I already showed you, this is how they most look, often look like in mature cells where they actually occupy almost 90% of the cell volume. So they're by far the most dominant organelle and the most influential organelle in the plant cell. However, they're also not just, again, they're not just this like a balloon sitting there. They also can be quite high dynamic and respond to changes in their environment. And here you can actually, as just an example, I'm showing you the change in the vector morphology in the uh, Aridopsis guard cells. So the guard cells actually are these two cell, uh, cells which form a pore, which allows a gas exchange in, within a leaf. So and that this pore opens and closes. And, and in response to that opening and closing, uh, the vacuole actually changes the morphology. When the stomata close, the vacuoles go from large and expanding into this fragmented form. And then the vice versa, when they open, they kind of revert to this. And this is, happens many times a day several times a day and also within a few hours of time. So it's a very rapid process. It's a very dynamic thing. So for us, as we are, uh, we work with ion channels, one of the particular, one information here was particularly interesting is the fact that vacuoles store ions. And for, and the very, it's a well known fact from before that actually one of the main ions that vacuoles store is calcium. They can actually store a huge amounts of calcium up to a thousand fold, high, a thousand fold higher concentration of the cytosol. So it was actually still feasible that, that, that in, in plants or in moss, piezos operate analogously to animals in a sense that they are able to, to release calcium into the cytosol for signaling, however, not from the extracellular matrix stores, but now from the internal, internalized store that sits in the vacuole. This actually this also made us wonder whether what is the orientation of piezos in the vacuolar membrane. So whether it's actually similar to the animals or different in respect to the how the ion, in respect how the ions flow across the membrane. 
So to test this, we actually tagged the C termini, which where we know where they are, which we tagged the C termini with the one half of RFP. And then we targeted the other RFP, uh, other half of the RFP, either to the cytosol or the vacuolar lumen. And then first we tested disorientation by targeting the other half into the lumen, and we actually did not observe any uh, RFP signal. So you do, the signal you see here is again out of rest of the cloud plus, so that's not an actual RFP signal. And this cell cell type we use this is a transit transformed protoplast. Protoplasts are cell wall cells, plant cells where the cell wall has been removed by enzyme, and so they're forced to sit in a solution that achieve uh, they're forced to do these perfectly spherical shapes. So this orientation doesn't seem likely. However, when we actually targeted the, the other half of RFP to the cytosol to test this other orientation, we indeed observed uh, now restoration of the RFP signal, which appears linked to the vacuolar membrane, as you can kind of see here in these examples, strongly suggesting that actually, yes, that, more, that most pieces have a very similar orientation in, in any, as animals in the sense that both their C termini is facing, facing the, <coughs> excuse me, Facing, facing the cytosol, or this is actually where the region where they enter, where the calcium enters the cytosol. So this was particularly interesting. So this was actually very exciting and really suggests that PS was indeed both now knowing that structurally they're sim potentially similar to animal cells, and they are actually still able to they sit in the proper position to allow the calcium for cytosol. So we were really interested in okay, how do they affect the cytosolic signaling, especially in those cells where we actually see some growth defects. And this was done with the help of our collaborator, Magdalena Bezanila from the Dartmouth College, which, so she imaged these, again, these are the same tip growing cells we observed before, and they actually are characterized by very complex calcium oscillatory profiles. So you can see there's, there's both tip forward calcium gradient, as well as a very rapid changes of the calcium signal, which is here quantified, which is here kind of quantified. It's, it's a very complex signal, but uh, she was able to, uh, but she was able to uh, decompose that complex signal into components with the discrete periods, which we kind of grouped into the short, medium, and long period components. And now with this kind of tool, we were able to compare whether we see any changes in response to a perturbation of piezo function. And here is actually what we saw when we compared the wild type cell versus the, the piezo double mutant cell, as well as over overexpressed mutants. And we didn't, it didn't see that there's actually alterations of the abundances of these individual components, specifically the medium period component, which must, was much less abundant in the double mutant, while on the other hand, in the overexpression, the short period component now became less abundant. And oops, excuse me. And furthermore, we also saw that in the overexpressors, the me short, the medium period component actually not only uh, changes its abundance, but also actually changed its period itself. So the, the period became longer. So this strongly suggests that piezos actually do affect cytosolic calcium oscillatory profiles. Either it, they do it directly as a channel themselves or indirectly. And it's something we are still interesting, uh, we're still testing and pursuing as a line of research. Whoever well, is a still big question is, but what they actually do in the cell? So, okay, they affect the cell growth, they affect calcium signaling, but what and how, what did they actually do? And so then we turn to actually see what did they actually do in, uh, what they actually do in, uh, in the vacuoles themselves. And before that, I'm gonna familiarize you how the vacuoles look like in these cell types. This is again, the same cell type we were looking all this time. So here is two different stainings. So this is a staining vacuole, a staining cells with the carboxy DCFDA, which stains vacuolar lumen. So here now we see that only the vacuolar lumen, and this is a maximum Z projection. And here we have another stain, stain which is called MDI64, which stains the vacuolar membrane or tonoplast, as well as some other internal membrane structures specifically most of the membrane. But you can easily identify vacuoles as these kind of empty black spaces surrounded by membrane. So that's the, 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 volume, the lumen of the vacuoles are being stained. And you can, kind of, you can kind of see them here. And the, in cyan, you see the, the out, of, out of fluorescence of the chloroplast. And so as you can see, the, uh, the tip growing wild type cells have a very complex cytomorphology. So in the tip region, they have this, what we named tubule-like vacuoles. Essentially, they almost will have like tubules which follow the longitudinal axis of the, of the growing cell, presumably to allow this kind of proper growth. However, in the region behind the nucleus, well, the cell is now more stationary. It's not growing actively in that region anymore. The vacuoles expand and occupy the large volume, almost a complete cell volume. 
However, when we actually looked at the double piezo mutants, we saw that they are actually unable to maintain this tubule-like like morphology in the tip growing system, in the tip region. So instead, they actually have large vacuoles throughout the whole cell, both before and after the nucleus. And often they actually get fused into one vacuole, pushing the nucleus to the side of the cell, displacing it from its normal essential position. And this, in respect to this function, both piezo one and piezo two appear to be redundant because they both need to be knocked out to see a full effect. In double mutants, almost all cells have these kind of morphology, while the single mutants have uh, some in, uh, have a ratio of cells with both morphologies are present. This was very exciting, but then uh, and we were actually able to complement this phenotype or suppress this phenotype by overexpressing either piezo one or piezo two. This should suggesting to us that the vacuole phenotype is directly linked to the piezo loci, and it's not some secondary effect. So, uh, so the, as you can see here, and then when we express, the vacuoles go from large and expanded, again, restoring their tubular from, tubul -like from uh, morpho morphology. However, during these experiments, we also noticed that in these overexpresses, we now start seeing more of these kind of internalized membrane structures, what we call like a bubble-like membrane structures. And you're gonna see here with the arrows, there's a couple of examples. The inside of the lumen of the vacuole, a membrane is appear and often looks, often looks like there's like a membrane inside of the membrane, like bubble inside of the bubble. And they actually quantified, and indeed we saw that in our especially period of two overexpressor, there's a significant increase in the amount of cells which actually uh, have that phenotype. The wild type can have that phenotype, but it's relatively rare. However, in the in the overexpressor it become, this becomes almost a majority in the norm. So it's kind of it's indicating to us that actually now the piezo is directly able to interact or affect the morphology of the vacuole and possibly somehow force the internalization of the vacuolar membrane. And to help us kind of further look into that, we actually took an inspiration from the animal field, where many uh, gain of function mutations have been uh, described. And we were particularly interested in this one, which causes the hereditary heterocytosis, which is linked to the mutation of this uh, arginine, which sits at the very end of the inner helix, which is a poor ion domain. So it's like right. It's a right where the ions flow. So this is the arginine we're interested in. And you can see uh, in humans, there's actually a couple of the mutations have been described. But in the wild type, you can see there's this characteristic piezo functions. It opens here in black. It opens very rapidly and also closes very rapidly in response to the mechanical signal. However, in these mutations, which is arginine to, uh, to lysine or histidine, we actually see that the channel is much slower in closing. It opens in the same as wild type. However, it actually takes a really long time to close it. Even stays open partially due, well, this, even after the signal is is removed. So it's a, they're hyperactive. They're, they stay open long, allowing the flow of more more ions to flow into the cytosol. And luckily for us, or at least why we pick this mutant, this actually this particular position is almost completely conserved among all piezo mutants, among all piezo some of these, all, all piezo homologs uh, among the uh, within eukaryotes. And this is, and again, we utilize the power of MOS genetics, and we're able to directly mutate. Uh, I think one or two base pairs within the genomes, the native loci of piezo two, to allow for this single nucleotide, uh, sing, single 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 uh, base amino acid change in the protein. And they actually saw the effect of the mutation. We were actually kind of astonished. It was actually how one single point mutation can cause dramatic changes. Kind of, and here is a kind of quick reminder. This is what wild type looks like. Generally, tubular-like vacuoles, which are relatively empty. However, in the gain of function mutants, we again see increase in those internalized bubble like function, uh, bubble like membrane structure inside of the vacuole. However, we also see so much more extreme phenotypes where the vacuoles expand and then a massive amount of very complex vac membrane structures being pulled inside of the vacuolar lumen, often, uh, for, often even associated with the part of the cytosol being pulled inside of the lumen. In the most extreme cases, and kind of my favorite phenotype is what we call membrane lamination, where the vacuoles actually get pulled into the lumen and get kind of almost rolled and pulled on itself, resembling puff pastry. Uh, so like a layers and layers of membrane get pulled on itself. And this is a phenotype we never observed in the wild type. So this was actually really exciting for us. So clearly there's a direct in, uh, uh, function of piezo. And before I move on, I'm gonna give you a quick summary of what the show so far. So I hope I convince you that piezo one, most piezo one and two modulate vector morphology in the tip growing cells. So they're actually required to maintain the normal tubule-like vacuoles in the tip regions because the loss of functions have these large expanded vacuoles. 
However, when we overexpress them or introduce this kind of hyperactive gain of function mutations, excuse me, we see this increase in vagination on the membrane. So the more membrane being pulled inside of the lumen, suggesting that piezo is promoting membrane invagination and possibly membrane fission. And this was really exciting, but however, this was the big question was, is this something very specific for MOS, this one specific cell type, this specific homologue, or this is a more broader, uh, broader ability or more broader characteristics of piezo? So we actually kind of turn our attention to a completely different part of our phylogeny, phylo phylo so the opposite side of the of the land plants, looking at a single homologue from the uh, flowering plant Rhodopsis taviana, which is a well solid model system. And just a kind of quick, quick, quick uh, reminder. So the Rhodopsis taviana is a deep, has a diploid genetics. It's a very simple to cultivate. It's a very small plant, making it very easy to grow inside of the growth chambers. It's a very fast growth cycle, about two months, which is very fast for a plant. It has a fully sequenced genome and many resources available for, for experiment. So, oops, excuse me. So we focus, we focus on that particular single homologue, and if we actually, if we look at the sequence homology for this, uh, the sequence homology between Arabidopsis and Moss piezo, we see that they actually again have most of their sequence homology lies within the core domain, so the inner helix, the terminal domain, and then as we kind of move away from that central domain, the homology, uh, the homology kind of drops off. Nevertheless, the Arabidopsis homologue was also able to localize to the, vacuola, to the vacuoles. Here we see uh, Arabidopsis plants overexpressing Arabidopsis piezo tagged with GFP. Here you see the vacuole in green from, pie, being pre, uh, from piezo pushing against the plasma membrane, which is here uh, labeled in magenta, as well as organelles like chloroplasts, which are here labeled in yellow. And this is a hypocotyl cell. And here it's again another example. We see a uh, free neighboring cells in the cotyledon, in the uh, not cotyledon, in the petioles, in petioles. And you can kind of kind of see that the the the, the vacuolar membrane decorated green because of the top piezo present pushes uh, other cytosol and organelles, such as chloroplast, in yellow against the cell wall, which is here like this the boundary between the free cells uh, highlighted with uh, with dashed lines. This was really, uh, so obviously the, the localization seems to be conserved. However, what was their function? And to this end, we again used CRISPR to create a knockout mutant. However, we did not observe any discernible whole plant phenotypes. So the loss of function phenotypes, the plants were completely fine. However, our collaborators from the Papaputian lab uh, were able to find that uh, root that uh, ATPSO one is involved in the root tip mechanism reduction, and in fact, the primary author on this publication, our collaborator uh, Ali Reza Muzavi, gave a presentation in the seminar series a few months back. And before that, their work there was also work suggesting that piezos, uh, Ardosis piezo is involved in the systemic virus spread. However, the exact mechanisms behind this is still unclear. And, uh, but our, our main interest was actually in the tip growing cells. So this is what we look in most, we focus on the tip growing cells. So we also wanted to look what happens with the tip growing systems in Arabidopsis. And the most famous cell type for that is actually a pollen tube, which grows away from the pollen grain. So when the, it's, a central, it's a central part of the plant reproductive system. When the pollen grain reaches a female flower, it generates a very long tube, which transports the genetic material to the, uh, to the uh, egg cell, allowing for fertilization. As you can see here in this quick movie, this cell is also, these cells are also characterized by a tip growth, where only tip grows while the rest of the cell stands more active. And this is extremely fast growing cell. This is a 40 minute video accelerated, but you can see they have a really rapid growth. And then we obviously were interesting, okay, how does vacuoles look like in these cells? Is there any similarities to moss? And this is how that actually look like in the wild type. This is now stained with BCECF, which stains again the vacuolar lumen, which we here see in red. And then in, in cyan, we see the cell staining of the cell wall. And again, you can see that further away from the tip, the vacuoles do become large. So these regions, which are not as actively growing anymore, they become large and kind of dominate the cells. However, as you approach the tip, the vacuoles become tubular-like or almost filamentous, like in this cell type, almost completely absent from the tip. And actually, when we look at the oops, uh, when we actually look at the piezo mutants, you can see that now the vacuoles in these mutants expand much close to the tip, almost as half as far from the tip. So they're they're bigger and much closer to the tip, affecting uh, which is actually very reminiscent of what we saw in moss, 
suggesting that it seems that the function, at least in the sense of the tip growing cell, is conserved among land plants. To kind of help na uh, nail this down, we uh, uh, or uh, we looked into uh, whether uh, Arabidopsis piezo is able to functionally complement the vacuolar phenotype of the moss mutants. As you can see, when you express Arabidopsis piezo in moss, they localize to the vacuolar membrane as expected. And indeed, yes, it's able to suppress that large expanded vacuolar phenotype. So the vacuoles go back into the normal tubule-like morphology we can see. But when we actually look a little bit closer, we actually saw that Yes, it is able to suppress this phenotype, but sometimes it actually overshoots that phenotype. Actually, over uh, there's a hyperpigmentation of the membrane. So not only kind of like makes tubules, but actually kind of makes little bubbles where the the the, the vacuum membrane gets completely fragmented and becomes fills with the cytosol as little bubbles, which we kind of call uh, hyperpigmentation or small bubble-like structures. This is most likely due to the expression levels, because here is a Western blood showing the expression levels in overexpression lines from both moss and Arabidopsis piezos. And you can see the Arabidopsis piezos expresses much higher levels, which likely accounts for this hyper, uh, hyperactivity. It's actually kind of pushing the vacuole way over normal, normal size, kind of pushing it to further fission and uh, kind of hyperfragmentation. So this, uh, uh, so, this really kind of uh, kind of nailed down for us that the piezo is indeed functionally conserved between Arabidopsis and moss, both in the sense of its localization and function. And as these two plants are representative of, of two very old lineages of land plants, we can assume or postulate that this actually function is conserved for all land plants. And it's something we are following up on and also following up what actually happened before and outside of the land plant lineages with algae. But here in the summary, I'm going to give uh, and hopefully convince you that plant piezos homologs modulate vector morphology of tip growing cells among, uh, within the land plants, which is possibly an ad adaptation. Uh, their, their deletion, either in moss or Arabidopsis, leads to the expansion of the vacuoles in the tip growing, uh, tip growing systems. The, the vacuoles become larger and occupy more of the volume of the, of the tip. However, when we overexpress or introduce the hyperactive versions of the gene into the into the into these cell lines, we see that there's actually excessive uh, the the membrane the increased membrane invagination or even excessive membrane fission, which led us to hypothesize that piezos function uh, that their function in the vacuole membrane is to perceive the vacuolar uh, perceive membrane tension within yet unknown uh, sources, and we are looking into which sources that might be. But in response to membrane tension, they actually open and release calcium from the vacuolar stores, which then recruits a, a machinery to promote, which promotes membrane, in, uh, membrane invagination first, and then ultimately membrane fission. So this was actually very exciting for us. And, uh, and the, you know, we don't know exactly why, but we speculated that the tip growing systems actually favor these fragmented vacuoles, these kind of small vacuoles, both to facilitate, uh, both because these smaller vacuoles might be better suited to quickly respond to the cha local changes in the environment. So you have a very long cell, so a smaller vacuole is able to respond to the different changes like the, what tip is experiencing versus what the later on in a shank or further down the cell. And it also, it could be simple that these uh, fragmented vacuoles simply allow other cellular machinery to work uh, and to do their jobs un 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 unimpeded because it's a very highly, these growth regions are very active parts of the cell. And another thing which is really kind of what my result highlighted or I hope highlighted is that really the importance of studying multiple excellent lineages to gain a better and fuller understanding of cellular and organellar mechanics. So now, before now, when we compare the data we got as well, our collaborator and a slew of really valuable data from animal cells, we can see there was a huge change in the functionality of piezos. In, in animals, they sit in a plasma membrane. However, in the plant cells, they sit in the vacuolar membrane. And it seems likely that this is over the, uh, since the, these two lineages split a little over one and a half billion years ago, piezos have been clearly adapted for quite different functions. It is possibly that this is an adaptation to what vastly different mechanics these two cell lineages ex, uh, evolved over time. For example, plant cells are surrounded by and cemented by a very strong cell walls, which allow them to build out huge levels of, uh, of uh, cellular pressure up to one megapascal, which is just for reference, 
it's a four times the, the car tire pressure and also gives them a really high elastic modulus. On the other hand, the animal cells are surrounded by usually soft extracellular matrix and can maintain much lower cellular pressures. So, uh, so we believe that uh, kind of this, by only studying different lineages, we can kind of gain this additional, addition, additional knowledge because all, this, all the excellent lineages exist today. They're experiencing now, and they have experienced in the past different mechanical challenges, and they solved a different, and they solved those challenges or overcome the challenges in a different manner. And so there's a lot of more valuable information and diversity of mechanics uh, out there for us to study. And recently, my postdoctoral advisor and I named this approach or if you will, a new evolution field as evolutionary mechanical biology or evil mechanism, which we think it should address the diversity of mechanical properties and mechanical signaling among all accent lineages and by comparing them to strive to understand their evolution and adaptation and adaptation to different mechanical circumstances. As I said, there's a lot like, a lot of research has been done on several model systems, and this was a really valuable research and really valuable information. However, there's a lot of variability outside of this couple of species, mouse, Arabidopsis, yeast. But there's a lot of more really cool things to, uh, cool questions to ask. And just as a couple of minutes, I'm gonna give a couple of examples for green lineage, but the same examples or like diversity can be found in all other lineages. We can see there's a huge variability in the body types or, or cellular organization between different species. For example, within the same group, we, we can see a, a different extremes here, like they can be in between this algal group, we have one of the smallest eukaryotic cell, only one microliter size, and one of the biggest eukaryotic cells within 35 millimeter in size. The question is what mechanics change between those two groups or those two species to allow these different cells to form and actually even function and operate? Or how some cells are actually still motile and single cellular versus others are more stationary and multicellular. And another big, big question for plants is how they actually ad adapted to the changes in the environment in evolution. There was a big change when plants went from salt water to fresh water. There was a huge osmotic shock with that, how this process adapted, as well as later on when they actually went from fresh water to land, which was a dramatic change. Uh, and required many adaptations to the very many new mechanical uh, challenges now that, that faced on land for starters uh, from the change, uh, rapid changes of motor pressure, but even to things like now much stronger gravity responses. Now on land, plants, uh, experience, plants and animals experience much stronger gravity than in water where normally gravity is counteracted by buoyancy. And so in response to that, actually, with plants, we see evolution of many different mechanisms for sensing gravity. Again, just an example, in land plants, the gravity is sensed through the activity of starch-filled plastids, amyloplasts, which function as a satellite. However, when we actually look at the hara, which is an algal species, which is a sister, one of the sister groups to land plants, they actually use vacuoles filled with barium sulfate crystals. And for many other algal species, we actually don't know how they sense. Uh, the gravity. So there's a really a lot of really interesting things to kind of look at uh, and really cool questions, in my opinion, to ask. And this just these few uh, examples, how uh, I hope convince you that it's really worth kind of trying to expand our interest and in kind of studying multiple multiple lineages and studying cellular mechanics on multiple sca uh, multiple scales, which will ultimately allow us to generate tools for engineering and controlling plant growth for different agriculture, medical, or other purposes, or even have applications for other non-plant system. Because I give examples for plants because I'm plant biologist, but the same system applies more, more broadly. And finally, I'm just gonna give a quick acknowledgement, specifically, especially everybody in the Hassel lab, especially Liz, who has been amazing and very supportive uh, advisor for many years. I'm particularly going to highlight the local Piezo team. So these are Ryan, who was attacking the lab, who did a lot of like background experiment and background support work, which was essential to make this project success, as well as Josh, another postdoc in the lab, who did most of the pollen, uh, pollen experiments I showed. And uh, especially thanks to all our collaborators, which current and past, which work on this and other projects, as well as funding, uh, including CMB, which funded some part. CMB actually funded my initial trip to Magdalena's lab to learn how to work with MOS. So it was instrumental to make this project happen, <laughs> to kind of switch from Arabidopsis to MOS or expand from Arabidopsis to MOS. So thank you for that. And then finally, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. 
Thank you, Ivan. Thanks for being on time. That's great. <laughs> I, I would like tried, tried. Applause. Okay. Um, so we have a couple of questions here. I'm just trying. I'm trying to go back to the Slack to see them, but okay. You can go ahead and read them. I'm not sure. All right. So Oswald Duza. Sorry if I butchered the name. Uh, he says, um, or she, the person says, I was wondering if piezo in planta could be involved in gravitational perception, namely gravitropism or gravity resistance under hypergravity. Could you share your thoughts on this, please? So actually, no, we thought that also, especially, but actually, uh, let me see if I actually have that. Sorry, let me just, it's always on Zoom. Uh, uh, okay, here. So yeah, so uh, actually, no, we actually tested this and uh, there is no, uh, there is, uh, the gravity response is normal in this minute. Ah, here, this is what I'm looking for. Let me see where we are. Ah, here it is. So this is here, uh, here is the, so this is actually the res gravity response of this, uh, of this, of these mutants. So this actually in hey, most. Ron, we are not seeing those slides. Oh, you're not I, seeing? Oh. I'm just seeing your acknowledgement. Thank you. Oh, okay, okay. Just Let me share again. I think I, okay, Thanks. now you see it? Thanks, Ron. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so here you can see, so this is actually a gravity response. So it's, in mosses, only this conemo cells, they're the only one that responds to gravity in the lack of light. They, in the dark, they actually grow against the gravity, trying to find the light from the soil, but they actually are perfectly fine. They grow less because the cells grow less, but they respond to gravity perfectly normally. We still don't know exactly what channels in plants are exactly involved in gravity response. Thank you, and I ha have a question. Um, is it, uh, uh, what, what, uh, so as you were talking, I was thinking of the of piezo as being a kind of a pressure release valve. And, uh, but you focused your attention on, on it releasing calcium. Yes. And so uh, maybe you could say something about that. So the, the, the distinction would be if it's pressure release valve, it would, it would be relatively nonspecific. It would, it would let all sorts of ions out. If it's, if it's highly specific for calcium, it would be, um, yeah, it would be highly specific. Um, yeah, exactly. So essentially, so the other family I mentioned in the beginning, so the other family where we work on the, M the MSL family or the MISCAT family, generally they are thought to be more as a pressure valve. They are uh, relatively unspecific. They have a slight preference for ions, but generally they will conduct anything. Piezo is not super specific. It conducts most cations. There's a certain difference in like the pre preferences. However, what I think the most interesting is actually the, when we look at the conductivity and the uh, time open. For example, if you compare MS, uh, MSLs, they actually have huge conductances. Once they open, they release a massive amount of ions directly controlling the, the change. Piezos actually have a very small conductances. I believe for most animals, it's about three picosimmons. So even when they open, they release very little ions. So there's not really much, and they also open a very short time. They don't really have a, they don't really have, a, so it's a very a small conductance, very short time. So that there's only time to control osmoregulation directly. It is possible that they can activate other channels, or calcium activated calcium channels or other, other proteins or potentially cause like a local changes, but more massive, it's less likely, if not impossible. But like MSLs, they generally tend to be, MSL channels tend to behave in that way. Right. Because they they, op they conduct much more ions and they stay open much longer, even past the initial stimuli, allowing for more regulation. Okay. Uh, still, the question still remains, I think, formally at least, that it, you, I mean, it, yes, it lets calcium through, and you uh, uh, propose that it's the calcium that then downstream affects the tonoplast mm -hmm. uh, uh, conformation, et cetera. Do you, do you have any evidence that, that supports that it's really the calcium that's um, mediating the downstream responses or? Not yeah. yet. We really, we're really interested in that. And this is something we're really following up on, but no, we don't have a direct evidence. But for example, there are other channels, like for example, in the vacuole membrane, there is a TPK channels, which are also mechanically activated. But before that, they actually require a calcium binding. 
So they conduct potassium primarily, and they actually conduct a lot of potassium. And so it's possible that a possibility, but this is again just a theory, is that uh, you know activation of piezo releases calcium, which then primes the TPK channels to activate and then release uh, and then release a lot of potassium. But you are right; it's possible that piezos are. We don't exactly know. So the collaborators they did do um, some some uh, some uh, patch clamping studies on on plant homologs, specifically the redoxis homolog. And they did show that it conducts calcium, but they had to make chimeras because of the, of the some targeting problems. And so we don't really exactly know quite yet the plant characteristics of it, uh, but we kind of operate with the hypothesis that they are primarily conduct calcium for signaling purposes. But your question and point stands, it's possible that they have other, other way of functioning. Okay. Uh, Charlie asked whether, Charlie Anderson asked whether the uh, piezo mutants have a stomatal phenotype? So I started to look into that and then we just kind of didn't have the time. So a very preliminary data suggests that there is some delay in the, the transition or the, or the fragmentations of the vacuoles when the actual stomata close and the vacuoles fragment. Like one experiment showed that there's actually a delay in doing that. They can do it, but that's far as I got. And then somehow other things took priority. And it's, I, oh no, I want to do experiments, but it's just like time is limited, unfortunately. <laughs> so, but we're quite intrigued by that question as well, yes. Especially, I mean, this is as we only focus on the tip growing cells. So there's a huge diversity of what actually happens in as stomata cells, other like a cell which grow by expansion. So these are all quite different cells, even in most anaerobidopsis. So it's really open question what actually happens in those all cell types, which have quite different vacuoles and different organization of the internal structure. So it's a lot of fascinating questions there as well. Okay. Uh, your postdoc advisor, Liz Haswell, posted a question. Uh, okay. Maybe this is, maybe this is, I'm not sure if the question is directed to you or to me since I raised the issue or uh, to everyone, um, uh, anyone that's okay. response. Okay, so what would be direct evidence that calcium is mediating downstream signaling, she asks. And uh, that's sort of mixed in with, a, with another thought I had in my mind is, and this is an idea that's been tossed about for a long time is, is if there are other uh, rep response pathways that involve calcium uh, fluxes in the re releases into the cytoplasm, how does the cell differentiate between that, between those different signals? Yes, yeah, it's so. So, so I guess uh, let, let me since since Liz asked the question to everyone, what would be direct evidence that calcium is mediating downstream signaling? Let me let me post that to the to the, the group at large. Uh, you can unmute if you want, or you could respond in the chat. Uh, let's let's pause for a minute to see if anyone has some suggestions. This is brainstorming, I guess. Yeah, but we'll we'll come back to Rambra also has a question. We won't forget that. <laughs> sharing to be more. That's okay, everyone. I can wait. <laughs> so I guess couldn't one piece of evidence potentially be if you found this, you know, if you did, if you found a second uh, if you did some kind of screen and you found suppressor mutants, you know, that let's say encode for some kind of cal modular, and now you lose some aspect of the phenotype, that would certainly at least suggest that that is a downstream component. Yeah, okay. And, uh, and, and Liz uh, put a note there if we could change the selectivity of the channel and alter signaling. So, yeah, that. Uh, but that would still. How would you? How would you eliminate the possibility of indirect effect? You know, of the change that now. Well, I guess yeah. I mean, I agree. I think it's one one step at a time, I suppose. If you could, if you could eliminate the the calcium conductance, but still allow other conductances, 
right? Uh, then, you know, and then depending upon the, uh, which way the results went, it might, might give an answer. All right. That's, I, I think it would be interpretable if the answer was- Can you introduce like calcium chelator into the cell and the cytoplasm? Yeah, okay, so. Yeah, there are some available, yeah. BAPTA is one of them which can be used. Yeah, so if you could, if you, could, if you could buffer the calcium response and selectively buffer the calcium response in the cytoplasm and therefore, and thereby ameliorate the response. Yeah, it might, that, I mean, that might be challenging. <laughs> yeah, but that would assume that the calcium is only coming through PSO. And it's uh, definitely maybe, not. <laughs> there may be, uh, right, yeah, there may be other, other proteins contributing to calcium release in the cell. Yeah. Plasma. Yeah, okay. But still, it comes back to my question of how does the cell differentiate? If it's, a, if it's only a calcium signal, how does the cell differentiate calcium signal through the piezo versus calcium signal through entirely different pathways? That's a I would say a Nobel Prize question. <laughs> it's a but very... I, so from what little I know, just from what I've eaten in the class, I, mean, you know, I think in, in other systems, you know, the spike frequency, the amplitudes, the characteristics of the calcium waves and spikes themselves are decoded in various ways. You can also, I guess, in principle, imagine how far that calcium gets, because there are so many calcium binding proteins that typically restrict the diffusion of calcium very, very quickly. Um, so you can imagine that maybe piezo effect has, has specific effects based on the, what, what else is in its vicinity. Maybe there are some proteins that interact with piezo on the C-terminal side that poise it to respond right off the bat. But I don't know if those are, you know, these, I'm just throwing out some ideas. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, absolutely. There are many pumps which actually pump calcium back in both plasma membrane, ER, vacuolar membrane. They can be in that close vicinity and a very local signaling, which are really hard to catch with like a broad, like the signaling I'm show, uh, show. We are working on to trying to make direct sensors, which will actually sense like directly tagging piezos with the, with the, fluoresc the calcium sensors to try to detect calcium flowing through piezo itself but we haven't got far away on that project quite yet. So that potentially could try to address that question at some point. Okay, yeah. so it's a few minutes after noon and I don't see any other questions. Does anyone in the audience have a, a question yeah. by Mike? Yeah, I, I had a question. I just, I mean, I just wanted to wait because I can always ask uh, Ivan just you know, down the hall later. Uh, but I just asked quickly, I was just wondering if it would be interesting to think about if you could introduce some of those vacuolar mutants, like cause vacuolar fragmentation through other mechanisms, right? In, in your piezo mutants, would that be, a, you know, a very so, so pose of vacuolar phenotype? So you were breaking up. Can you repeat the oh, question? Um, would it be interesting to, to introduce a vacuolar morphology mutant mutation mm -hmm. in your piezo mutant lines? You know, where yeah. you force the vacuolar morphology, let's say uh, preferentially at the tip, to be different, you know, in either direction with the suppressor and hand. So, and I don't know if it would be worth doing it. I mean, de definitely it's, yeah, because it's still unclear what mechanisms PS, and I'm really interested to see what mechanisms actually PSOs use to control the, the morphology or promote invagination. We are relatively certain it does do that, but like, is it, it's possible it does it on its own? PSO is a very big, and so they actually bend membranes. So theoretically, they could even act as a member bender even without a calcium signaling. They could just do it just by somehow changing the, their, their uh, free the structures or recruiting something else. So it's definitely interesting to kind of follow up and I'm hoping to have the opportunity in the future to follow up on there, but there's only so many questions that you can ask it in time, but yes, absolutely. Yeah, so my naive thought was, you know, cytoskeleton obviously is involved in a lot of membrane morphogen, you know, tubulation, things like that, and in, in, in I, systems. I'm, and yeah. it's dense right at the tip. There's so much cytoskeleton, as mm -hmm. you mentioned. I was, my first thought was, it would make sense to tubulate the vacuoles there to give, make room for all that tip growth transport and that's, yeah. to happen. That's Maybe, exactly what happened. And, and a lot of the cytoskeleton remodeling proteins are calcium sensitive. 
maybe there's a connection there. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. That it's actually it's possible that we have a vacuole and then the cytoskeleton just kind of rams into it. And then piezo senses that and kind of, okay, now we have to make a way for the cytoskeleton to go, go as like a highway it needs to go through. It's a possible one way of actually maintaining that tubular -like form formation. And uh, it's possible that invagination is just a process in the fission. But yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating question and definitely very interesting, especially with cytoskeleton, that's a really, I mean, obviously, I know it's for you a great question, but I'm also quite interesting where it, I think, if, if any, the cancer of skeleton might be one of the main kind of actors in that process. My dream is we're going to have a colors like label of skeleton, label vacuum, label peers, and actually see live how they all interact. But that's kind of dream, dream experiment. But we'll see what's possible in the future to actually do. 